Well, amen. Do we have a Mountain Dew video tonight? Okay. Do we have a Mountain Dew video tonight? Seen one like that. I thought we were going from this all the way to the two liter, but uh, Brother Tyson's left him some place to go tomorrow night and got it all organized. And uh, I love that, brother, and I love all of you. I just want you to know that. What a blessing to be back tonight in the house of God. And uh, before I show you something on the screen, I just want to say thank you to all of you that have been so gracious and so kind to take, uh, take me out for meals uh, whether it be at the noontime or in the evening after the service tonight. We went out before the service. Uh, that just worked a little better. But last night I had a wonderful time of fellowship with a dear couple in this church. Tonight I had another great time of fellowship uh, before the service. And it's just been that way every, every time we've gone out together. And I just cannot thank you enough. And I do want you to understand, if I stayed around here very long, I'd look like the Goodyear blimp. I would. I just would. <laughs> because of the way you, uh, you feed the people that come here and take such good care of them. But I appreciate that so very much. Um, I want to show you something, but before I show you this, I just want to, again, underscore a couple of things as far as a matter of prayer. Pastor mentioned our pastor, Jerry Gamble. Uh, he's been pastor at our church, Mount Home Baptist Church in Morganton, North Carolina, for 50 years. 50 years. It doesn't seem possible, does it? He's 82 years of age. And he pastored a, a, a ch another church or two in the area uh, in the midst of the, you know, in addition to rather the 50 years he's been at our church. And uh, he's been struggling, as I told you the other, other day. And uh, this morning early, I got a phone call from one of the guys on our staff saying that uh, pastor's in the hospital, that his, his calcium level in his blood went really high yesterday. And uh, he was experiencing some symptoms that uh, required he go to the hospital they did some blood work and basically, basically told the family that uh, they don't think his heart, and he's had some heart issues in the past, they don't think his heart is strong enough to continue to support uh, the bodily functions. And so they have basically, I think at his request, uh, taken him off, you know, all things other than some pain medication. And my wife was able to go by this afternoon and, uh, and talk to him there in the room. I called and talked uh, to his wife. I think he was resting whenever I had an opportunity to call. But while my wife was in the room with Pastor and Ms. Gamble and the family, uh, our son Nathan called my wife and uh, she answered and she said, I'm, I'm with Pastor. And uh, she looked at Pastor Gamble and he hadn't been really responsive, but she said to Pastor, she said, Squirrel wants to talk to you. Now, Pastor nicknamed our son Nathan Squirrel because he said every time he comes into the church, he's over here talking to this person, then he's over here talking to this person. I look over there and he's back over here. You know, he's up on the balcony, you know, talking to everybody. And that's Nathan. He, he just loves people. And so he nicknamed him Squirrel. And uh, when my wife said, uh, I've got Squirrel on the phone, he wants to talk to you. My wife said, Pastor Grin from ear to ear and perked up. And uh, Nathan was able to talk to him for a few minutes. And he loves to hear Nathan sing. And Nathan said, I would sing for you, Pastor, but I'm, uh, I'm in a very crowded area. And there's a lot of back, uh, background noise from people talking. And he just said, I, I probably can't do it right now. But anyway, uh, God has been so good and God has been so gracious. And uh, Ms. Gamble said to me uh, this afternoon on the phone, she said, uh, it's tough. And she began to tear up a little bit. And I said, I know it is. But she said, God is so good and God is so gracious. And about three weeks ago, uh, I had the chance to go by and visit with Pastor there at the home, took another gentleman with me. We prayed together, we laughed together, we sang together. And um, that may be, that may be on this side of eternity, the last time that I had that type of a conversation with him. I saw him July 2nd uh, when I was preaching at our home church on the 4th of July Sunday and got to see him and chat with him briefly. But anyway, all of that to say this, please continue to pray for Jerry Gamble, continue to pray for the family and uh, pray for God's will. And then the other thing I want you to pray about is tomorrow night, tomorrow night, uh, something very important going on. Again, if you want to know what it is, uh, just ask me. Several people have, a number of people have asked me what's going on tomorrow night, what's going on next Tuesday. I'm more than delighted to share with you individually what that is, but it keeps just getting bigger and bigger. And I, I, I can't go into why that's the case. Uh, but anyway, all of it to say this, it's an enormous opportunity tomorrow night for Nathan and Amber and then Tuesday night of next week for my wife and I, Nathan and Amber and our Hope to the Hill team. And so if you want to know more about that, just ask me. Uh, again, I want to underscore just how good God is. Don't we serve an awesome God? We just serve an awesome God. And in the darkest of times, the Lord has always had a remnant of his people and always worked 
in the midst of the darkest of times to shine a light brightly, and he's certainly doing that right now. And so as you're watching the news and maybe a little bit discouraged with even what was on the news today, and I saw a little of it, uh, I want you to understand God is greater than anything that's happening in the news. He just is. And uh, he'll take these things that are going on and he'll weave a tapestry out of them to get glory to himself and to allow the gospel to go out and the truth to go out. And that's what's happening tomorrow night. And that's what's going to happen on Tuesday night of next week. It's just amazing to me as I watch how God works. And so uh, we just appreciate your prayers about all of that. Now, I want to show you something. Uh, July of uh, last year, um, actually, no, I'm sorry, it was a little, a little before that. Uh, we were in Washington, D.C. with another large group of 200 and some people. And as I told you the other night, we always try to conclude uh, our after hours tour of the United States Capitol by going into the Capitol Rotunda. And I mentioned the eight paintings that go around the circular wall of the Rotunda. Five of the eight are overtly religious. Uh, and I won't go into all of that, but we always, if we have someone that can sing, they're always asked to step to the middle of the Capitol Rotunda and the echo in there is like a giant bathroom. I mean, it's hard to sound bad inside the Capitol Rotunda. And uh, some of you may say it's like a bathroom for other reasons. But anyway, no, anyway, uh, I, I didn't say that. But anyway, the, back, the bottom line is this. Uh, the Capitol Rotunda is an august place. It's an amazing room uh, to go into. In fact, the top of the dome of the Capitol is taller than the Statue of Liberty on the inside as you're standing on the inside. Now, you wouldn't think that, but it is. It's an amazing thing. But anyway, uh, as you go in there, uh, the echo in there is just absolutely phenomenal. And so this particular night that you're about to watch, uh, we had the 70-member Wilmington Celebration Choir with us. Have any of you ever heard of the Wilmington Celebration Choir from Wilmington, North Carolina? They're just a group of people that have all gotten together from various churches, and they travel now as a group and sing. And uh, I didn't really know a lot about them, but we used them there in Washington. D.C. and we trekked them all over the Capitol. They're some of the greatest people I've ever met. Never heard a word of complaint about any of them. What you're about to watch was in the United States Capitol at 1130 at night. 1130 at night after having walked about eight miles that day. And for these people to sing like they sang with the joy of the Lord in their heart and the joy of the Lord on their countenance was amazing. But uh, I leaned over to the member of Congress that had taken us in there, and I said, have you ever heard of the Wilmington Celebration Choir? He said, no, Dave, I haven't. I said, well, we've got 70 of them with us tonight. Uh, would it be okay if they sang here in the rotunda? He said, well, absolutely. Well, about two measures or less into the start of the song you're about to watch, he had his cell phone out and was videoing every bit of it because it was so beautiful. I want you to watch this. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to understand that God is alive and well in Washington, D.C., and his name is being proclaimed and is going to continue to be proclaimed in a mighty and powerful way. The title of the song is, I Go to the Rock. That's
Amen. As you take your Bibles tonight and turn to the book of Acts chapter number 19, let me just remind you that coming up in January of 2024, we're going to be doing a trip called History and Hymns to Washington, D.C. And again, the featured musicians are going to be you. We're going to take a few of uh, professional musicians, I guess you would call them well-known gospel musicians, just a few, but the featured singers are going to be you, just regular folks. And we're going to be going uh, into the Capitol building, several other places around Washington, D.C. We're just going to be doing impromptu worship services, impromptu to from the people that attends uh, Vantage Point. They'll be planning on our part. But anyway, we're going to be doing those and uh, we're going to be, Lord willing, in the Capitol Rotunda conducting a worship service in the Capitol Rotunda. Can I hear an amen right there? By the way, that room is normally reserved for uh, state funerals and things like that. And uh, normally, normally there has never been anything like what we're talking about allowed there. But I'm so thankful right now for how God is working that we're going to be able to do some of that. It's going to be absolutely amazing. And that is in June of 2024. If you'd like to know, learn more about that trip, uh, you can go to our website for our trips like this. It's called Passages DC, as in District of Columbia, PassagesDC.com, PassagesDC.com. You can scroll down to the History and Hymns tab. Click on that. It'll give you all the information about what we're going to be doing. Uh, you can sign up. It's kind of a turnkey trip. Uh, you pay one price. That includes your hotel for the entire time you're there, all of your meals while you're there, and getting into all the things that we're going to get you into, uh, which are not trouble. We're not going to get you into trouble, all right? But we're going to get you into buildings and into places and it's going to be uh, absolutely amazing and we're going to have a wonderful, wonderful time honoring the Lord and praising the name of our Savior in song and in worship and in the Word uh, in some amazing places that have never experienced anything like that. You say, preacher, why do you want to do that? Because there is a cleansing effect of the Word of God any place it's taken. Can I hear an amen? Whether the Word is sung or whether the Word is preached, uh, there's a sanctifying effect and a cleansing effect that the Word of God has and so what we want to do, we've been doing it, but we want to do it in a much bigger way, and that is carry the Word of God in song, carry the Word of God in spoken word into some of these locations, and just see the Lord do some amazing things. And I'll promise you this, that night when the Wilmington Celebration Choir started singing, everybody that was in the Capitol heard that. All the employees, the people cleaning heard that, and it brought everything to a standstill at 1130 at night, and it was absolutely amazing. Anytime anybody sings in the rotunda, it does that. And so we're just trying to be a witness for our Savior, and you can be a part of it in a big way, as well as learn something about the history of our country by participating in history and hymns in January of 2024. Acts chapter number 19. Hope you found it. If you have, look up at me for just a moment. Uh, by way of introduction, I want to share something with you. Uh, my dad pastored uh, for 40 years almost before the Lord took him home. He died uh, relatively young. Uh, my dad had never been sick a day in his life. Our family has traditionally been very, very healthy, but my dad was coming down a ladder from helping the men re-roof the church. He took a misstep, fell backwards, broke part of his pelvis, not, not out by the hips where the weight-bearing part of the pelvis is, but pelvis is a bowl-shaped structure and he just cracked a little part of the, the, the pelvis. It was painful, but it was not something that kept him from moving around. But three months later, uh, a blood clot formed and moved through his heart into his lungs, turned sideways. It's called a saddle embolism. And my dad stopped breathing like that and went home to be with the Lord. My dad was an amazing man, a funny man. Uh, my dad never met a stranger. He just loved people. But when he pastored in the mountains of North Carolina, he pastored a little church called Faith Baptist Church. And our home was the church parsonage in those days. And pastor, I'm not joking. It was a four room, five rooms if you counted the bathroom. It was four rooms, a living room, a kitchen, and two bedrooms. That was it. It was a little cracker box house. And uh, I remember it vividly. I don't know how we lived, you know, in such a tiny place, but we did. But diagonally across the front yard of that little cracker box house was a mountain North Carolina cemetery. Now, I don't to this day understand quite how they were able to do this, but in those days, they would bury people on the sloping side of a hill. They would dig into the sloping side of a, of a mountainside, and they would actually bury people there, and that was what that uh, country cemetery was, and there were some grave markers in that cemetery that dated all the way back to the Civil War, and one or two that went back further than that. So anytime we had visitors come to our house or pastor or preacher come to preach in our church, my dad would take them over there to that mountain cemetery to 
show them all those graves. There were two graves in that cemetery that my dad always, always, always pointed out. The two grave markers were side by side. You could tell by looking at them and by reading what was on them that the two ladies buried beneath those grave markers had both been wives of the same man. Now, I don't mean wives of the same man at the same time, okay? I don't mean that. I don't mean that he was a polygamist. That's not what I'm suggesting. But he had married his first wife. She died. He outlived her. He remarried. He outlived his second wife, buried his second wife beside his first wife. You could tell all of that by reading what was on the tombstones. What was fascinating was this. On the grave marker of the first lady, was her name, date of birth, date of death. But preacher etched into the tombstone, artistically, beautifully etched into the grave marker was a woman's hand, a woman's hand. Around the wrist portion of the woman's hand, there was a chain which was attached to a shackle. The index finger carved into the grave marker, the index finger of that delicate woman's hand was extended, but the hand was turned on the grave marker, etched into the grave marker so that the finger was pointing down. Now, the only thing I know to take from that is this. That man didn't think much of his wife, and in his estimation, that's the direction she went. Is everybody with me? Now, ladies, may I say this? If your husband outlives you, he does get the final word, okay? He just does. So you may want to think about that. Men, same thing applies for us. If they outlive us as our wives, they get the final word. And to be honest with you, that's just absolutely terrifying to me to think about. But anyway, that was literally on the first grave marker. Beside that one was the grave marker of the man's second wife. Preacher, it had on there her name, date of birth, date of death. Etched into that grave marker was a delicate woman's hand. It was beautifully uh, carved into the granite. And uh, the, the, the hand was kind of open like this and diagonally down between the thumb and index finger, going this way at an angle, was a long stem rose etched into the grave marker. These three fingers were across, clutching the long stem rose. The index finger of that hand on that grave marker was extended, but it was pointing up. So I guess what he was saying is my first wife went this way, my second wife went this way. It's the only thing I know to take from that. My dad would apply that, and I want to apply it for you tonight. A grave marker is the last reminder to everybody that outlives us as to what our life counted for. Are you listening to me? Somebody said this, live your life in such a way so that when you die, you don't leave a grave marker, you leave instead a legacy. That's good advice. If there was anybody who left by the life he lived, a legacy, not just a marker or a monument, it's the man whose life I want us to look at very briefly tonight, found in the book of Acts, chapter number 19. Now, I'm going to tell you right up front, the man's name is Paul, the apostle Paul. I'd love to go through the entirety of the book of Acts. We don't have time to do that tonight. But the Holy Spirit has done an amazing thing in Acts 19, kind of in capsule form. In capsule form, the Holy Spirit has given us the impact and the influence of the apostle Paul's life in one chapter. You say, preacher, what do you mean by that? Well, I'm going to show you what I mean in just a second with the help of the Holy Spirit. But I want to tonight tell you where we're going. We're going to look at the apostle Paul's life. We're going to then take our life and match it up next to the Apostle Paul's life. We're going to look at where Paul was known and for what he was known. And then we're going to ask ourselves this question, where am I known and for what am I known? You say, preacher, I'm not sure I'm following you. I think you'll understand where we're going in just a second. Now, I want you to look, if you would, please, at Acts 19. Let your eyes rest on verse number 1. Acts 19, verse number 1. The Scripture says, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus. Now, I want to pause, have you look up at me. If you know anything about the ancient city of Ephesus, Ephesus was to the ancient world every bit of wit Uh, uh, every bit of what Chicago, Illinois would be to the modern world. Ancient Ephesus was a thriving metropolitan city. Thousands of people on a daily basis would traverse through the streets of ancient Ephesus. And Paul arrives there in that thriving metropolitan city. And I want you to notice what he does. By the way, pastor, every city Paul goes into, he does exactly the same thing. But it is recorded for us in Acts 19, looking, if you would please, at verse number 8. Look where, where Paul went. Look what he did. Verse 8 says, and he, Paul, went into the synagogue. Every time Paul arrived in a city, he'd make a beeline to the synagogue, and he would as quickly as possible, as thoroughly as possible, stand up, begin preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ought to hear an amen right there. It says in verse 8, and he went into the synagogue, watch this, and spake boldly by the space of three months. 
disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now watch carefully verse number nine. But when divers, and by the way, the word divers in the King James Version, it literally means all sorts of. When all sorts of people, look at the rest of verse number nine, but when divers were hardened, literally all sorts of people were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way. By the way, in the book of Acts, anytime you see the word the way or that way, it is always a direct reference to the way of Christianity. All right? So Paul arrives in town. Pastor, I love this. He preaches in the synagogue, and some people that heard him did not respond well. They were hardened. That tells me there was something about Paul's message that didn't set well with everybody. Is everybody listening to me? See, folks, I want to say this, and I, and I mean it in the right way, and I, I know you'll take it the way I mean it. But the bottom line, folks, is this. I am not preaching tonight. Pastor Steve, when he stands up here on Sunday and Sunday night and his ministry here continues, he's not preaching primarily to please you. He is preaching to please the Lord. Can I hear an amen? And if an audience of one is pleased, really, Pastor, that's all that matters. Is everybody with me? Now, I love you. Your pastor loves you. He does. He loves you. I know. I've been around him. He loves you. But the fact of the matter is this. His number one loyalty and commitment is to the God of heaven. So when something that is more difficult to maybe swallow has to be communicated, it is communicated in love, but it is communicated primarily with a passionate love for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Paul's preaching ministry. And divers, all sorts of people were hardened, the Bible says, and believed not, but spake evil of that way, the way of Christianity before the multitude. Now, when that happened, I want you to notice what Paul did. He did not do what many a modern-day preacher would do. When it didn't work in the synagogue, he didn't say this, Pastor. He didn't say, well, the rest of my time in Ephesus, I'm going to find myself a giant lazy boy recliner. I'm going to kick the footrest up on that baby, and I'm going to take a vacation the rest of the time in town. He didn't do that. No, what he does is he finds himself an alternative place to preach. You say, preacher, where does he find to preach? I want you to watch your Bible. Look, if you would, please, at verse number 9 again. But when divers were hardened, believe not, but spake evil of that way, the way of Christianity before the multitude, he, Paul, departed from them. That is, he left the synagogue. He departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. In other words, pastor, he leaves the synagogue. The place he finds to preach the word of God is a school run by a gentleman whose name is Tyrannus. By the way, the word Tyrannus means tyrant. Tyrant. Can you imagine anybody wanting to attend a school when the headmaster's name means tyrant? Can you imagine that? I can't really imagine that. But this is not the kind of school that we're thinking of. It was not a school with desks and pencils and erasers and chalks and chalkboard. It wasn't that kind of school. The school of Tyrannus was a lecture hall. I have not been there, but my, brother, my, my son has. He called me when he was over in Europe visiting, and uh, he happened to go into ancient Ephesus, and he called me and said, Dad, I'm standing. I'm standing. Can I FaceTime you? I said, please do. He said, I am in the school of Tyrannus, the lecture hall of Tyrannus. He said, Dad, it's just like you've described it. It is a tiny little room compared to the magnitude of the city of ancient Ephesus. And he kind of showed me on FaceTime, you know, uh, what the room looked like. Tiny little room. Paul goes there to preach the word of the living God. Now, I want you to watch what happens when he does that. Look, if you would, please, at verse number 10. It says this, and this continued. That is, this preaching ministry Paul had in the school, the lecture hall, literally, of Tyrannus. This continued by the space of two years. Now, folk, I want to show you this. It bears being noted. To speak in the lecture hall of Tyrannus for two years was not free. There was a rental fee attached to it. So pastor evidently, evidently out of his own pocket, the apostle Paul paid a rental fee for two years to have a place to preach. I don't know about you. I like this guy, don't you? Look at the rest of verse 10. And this continued by the space of two years so that all they which dwelt in Asia. Can I back up and read that again? So that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now, folks, look up at me for just a second. The first place Paul was known, and the first thing for which he was known is this. Now, stay with me. I know I'm kind of laboring a point here, but I want you to stay with me because 
It's going to pick up here, okay? I want you to see this. He was known, and I'm going to call it this because it's true. He was known in the halls of learning. He was known in the halls of learning. The lecture hall of Tyrannus, preacher, was something else that I've not yet mentioned. It was a place that was known in the ancient world as being the spot when traveling philosophers came through Ephesus, they had for at least one afternoon a standing invitation to come to the lecture hall of Tyrannus, stand up, and they could espouse, they could teach, they could communicate their particular philosophy of life. Well, Paul comes to this place. He's not teaching philosophy. He's preaching the word of the living God, and he does it over the space of two years, but he's doing it in the spot where the most brilliant-minded men of his day have stood. Is everybody with me? He is now known in the halls of learning. You say, Brother Dave, known in the halls of learning for what? He is known in the halls of learning for his intellect. For his intellect. You say, preacher, why would you say that? Now, I, I, I kind of pointed out as I was reading uh, one of the early verses, but I didn't, I didn't single it out. I'm going to single it out right now. Pastor, there's three words that are used in the New Testament. They're used in the book of Acts. Two of them are used in this chapter several times. Three words that are used to describe Paul's preaching. When Paul stood up to preach, the three words are these. He reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Okay? Number two, he disputed with them out of the scriptures. And by the way, disputed doesn't mean he argued with people. It just means this. He stood up like an attorney in a courtroom, line upon line, precept upon precept. He just showed people that Jesus was who he claimed to be. He was the Christ, the son of the living God. Can I hear an amen? He reasoned with people. He disputed with people. And the third word is this. He persuaded people. By the way, that means this. Paul's preaching was not primarily emotional in nature. Now, I'm just going to be candid with you. Uh, I, I'm an emotional person. You say, preacher, really, are you? I'm not convinced that you are. Yes, I'm an emotional person. I am. I, I get a little animated. By the way, I figure if I can go to a ball game and get a little excited, and that's temporal, I ought to be get a lot excited about the eternal truth of God's Word. Are you with me? So I'm a very emotional person. I'm not condemning emotion. But I am saying this. There ought to be some content along with the emotion. Does everybody hear what I'm saying? Let me ask us a question. Are we known in the halls of learning for our intellect? You say, preacher, what does that mean? Now, let me just talk about my calling the ministry. Uh, do, any of you, <laughs> do any of you know what a North Carolina wind-sucking preacher is? How many of you know what they are? We were talking about it the other day, weren't we, Pastor? If, if you've not yet been educated, I'm going to educate you on what a North Carolina windsucking preacher is. Here's what they do. They'll get to going and they'll preach like this. Well, bless God. Ha, I tell you what. Ha, Jesus is coming soon. Ha, and they do the ha at the end of everything. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Listen, I'm not condemning that. I'm not, I, I like it, okay? I like it, okay? But I want there to be some content along with it, if you understand what I'm saying. So anyway, I was listening to the radio in Hickory, North. I'm not a big radio listener. Uh, I'm on Christian radio. I, I have a talk show, but I, I don't often listen to, to Christian radio. I just got so much going on. But I was driving somewhere, and I had the Christian radio on in Hickory, North Carolina, and there was one of these North Carolina windsucking guys on, and I'm just going to say what he said. He said, well, bless God, I'm ignorant, and I just pray I get ignorant -er. I'm ignorant, and I just pray I get ignorant -er. <laughs> Now, brother, have you ever been tempted to do this? I wanted to grab the phone, call the radio station, and say, your prayer's been answered. Your <laughs> prayer has been answered. Because ignorant -er is not a word. <laughs> I'm ignorant, and I just want to get ignorant -er. As if being ignorant, preacher, is somehow making you more spiritual. Can I say this? It does not. Ignorance does not equal spirituality. There are some people that think that. Listen, you can be intelligent, you can have a highly trained mind, you can have a great education, and you can still love Jesus passionately with all your heart. The two are not mutually exclusive. Can I hear an amen? What I'm saying is this. Paul was known in the halls of learning for his intellect. Are we known in the halls of learning for our intellect? You say, preacher, what, what, what's that mean? Let me give you an example. 
Pastor, several years ago, I was preaching in a church on a Sunday morning, first time I'd ever been there, gave the invitation, I'll never forget this, three women, three men, six people total walked forward to give their heart to Jesus Christ and be saved. That's, can I hear a hallelujah? That's amazing. The pastor had only been there a couple of months. I could sense his dilemma immediately. He's standing there, sees three women coming, three men. He's, he's looking over his congregation, trying to find a lady he's got enough confidence in that can take, or several ladies that can take the three ladies and some of the men in his church that he has enough confidence in that can each individually take one of the three men and open their Bible and lead those people to Jesus Christ. Are you listening to me? I'm not sure if it's because he wasn't there long and didn't know his people. I'm not sure if he did know his people and just realized maybe they're not ready to do this. But what happened is this. He took the three men, his wife took the three ladies, and they each led those folks to Christ. But what broke my heart is this. Maybe he couldn't find three men he was confident enough in that know how to take the gospel and share it with someone and lead them to Jesus. Are you listening to me? What I'm trying to say is it's not just Pastor Steve. Oh, he's a missionary, Brother Dave. He's a former missionary in Bulgaria. This is what he specializes in. And yes, it is what he specializes in. But it's not just him and his sweet bride's responsibility to know how to take the Bible and lead someone to Jesus. That is all of our responsibility that know the Lord. And by the way, it's all of our privilege who know the Lord. Can I hear an amen? What I'm asking is this. Are we known in the halls of learning for our intellect? Paul was. Now, watch your Bible. There's a second place Paul was known and a second thing for which he was known. Look at Acts 19, verse number 23. Now, buckle in tight. This is an amazing thing. Get your airbag ready. We're about to have a collision here. I want you to see this. This is awesome. Look at Acts 19, 23. And the same time, the same time that Paul's renting this lecture hall, it run by Tyrannus to have a place to preach in the city of Ephesus. The same time that that's going on, look what happens. And the same time there arose, and I love the words the Holy Spirit uses here, there arose no small stir about, here it comes again, that way, the way of Christianity. That means this, ladies and gentlemen, if it's not a small stir, it means it's the complete opposite. It's a big stir. Do you know every time Paul went into a town, started preaching, something got stirred up. Are you with me? When is the last time in Champaign, Illinois, that you had an evangelist come in? Maybe, Brother Mark, maybe it was the, the time whenever Billy Sunday came and preached over in Springfield. Maybe that's the last time something really significant got stirred up in this area. If that's the last time, would you agree with me? That's tragic. That is tragic. When's the last time in my town of Hickory, North Carolina, somebody came in and preached the Word of God with such power that something got stirred up? I can about tell you it was back in the 40s, the 1940s, when that happened. Can I say this? That's doubly tragic. We ought to have the power of God on us when we show up. Man, something ought to get stirred up for good. Paul arrived. It wasn't a small stir. It was a big stir. And I want you to notice it was about that way. The way of Christianity. Well, Brother Dave, what was the nature of the stir? Look at verse 24. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith which made silver shrines for Diana, brought, and here's the phrase again, no small gain unto the craftsman. That means this. If it's not small gain, it's the complete opposite. It's big gain. Are you with me? Question, who was Demetrius? Who were the silversmiths? Folks, ancient Ephesus was the home location of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was called the Temple of Diana, or secular terminology, the Temple of Artemis. Artemis of the Ephesians. Do you know the Temple of Diana, according to historical accounts, by the way, you can read it for yourself, was 425 feet long? You, you say, preacher, I'm not impressed. Well, you should be. Let me tell you why. A football field is 300 feet long. Add another 125 feet onto that, and you've got the length of this massive building called the Temple of Diana. 425 feet long, 225 feet wide. Preacher, this thing is about as wide as a football field is long. 
There's 157 columns around the outside that support the massive roof that is over this, this building. And as you came in the back of the 425 foot long building, you came down a 425 foot long corridor or aisleway all the way to the front of the building. And at the front of the building, carved from a meteorite that had fallen from the sky, was a 50 foot statue of Diana or Artemis of the Ephesians. Now I'm going to have to be very careful here. If you've ever looked in a secular history book and seen a picture of Diana of the Ephesians, Artemis of the Ephesians, you will understand why I cannot describe her any further in a mixed audience. She was vulgar in the extreme. Well, Brother Dave, who were the silversmiths? Who was this dude, Demetrius? I'll tell you who Demetrius was and who the silversmiths were. They were craftsmen who made about a, I don't know, 18-inch tall, 20-inch tall replica statue of the 50-foot statue that's in the Temple of Diana. And these replica statues, these tourist size, if you want to say it that way, statues were set up in the marketplace in Ephesus on shelves and tourists coming through could purchase one of those, forgive me, pornographic images and take it home with them. May I say this? Demetrius was an ancient pornographer. Paul shows up in Ephesus and the pornography trade gets a little upset. Can I hear an amen? Wow. When's the last time the pornography people got upset with us? By the way, this film, Sound of Freedom, the common denominator, according to Tim Ballard, in all human trafficking, sex trafficking, child sex trafficking. The common denominator, Tim Ballard said, Dave, is pornography. It's all driven by pornography. Now, men, I love you. And I'm made out of the same stuff you are. There's not an S on my chest. I'm not Superman. I'm not super Christian. I'm not super preacher. I'm made out of the same stuff you are. I've got eyes like you've got. But men, I'm here to tell you, we're going to have to put a guard on our eyes in the day in which we're living. Can I hear an amen? Pastor, I was preaching in Indiana. A man comes up to me after the service. It was a men's conference. He said, preacher, can I talk to you? Everybody else is on their way to lunch. I said, yes, let's sit down. I sit on the front row. He turned toward me. I turned toward him. He said, Brother Dave, he said, I work in the computer field. And he's telling me his whole story, which was very fascinating. He said, but I work in a, a place where there's about 30 of us that work together. And he said, everybody usually leaves around 12, 12, 15 for lunch. He said, everybody had gone. I stayed behind to do a little bit of work this particular day that I'm describing. And he said, I typed in what I thought was a website address. He said, I must have hit a wrong key or two because up onto the screen came pornographic images. He said, man, quickly I got that off the screen. But he said, isn't it amazing? And by the way, guys, it is amazing. He said, isn't it amazing that I could not forget that website I typed in? He said, the first time it was an accident. He said, two days later, it wasn't. He said, everybody's going to lunch. He said, I type in that website this time on purpose. And he said, up come the images. He said, I looked at those, gazed at those images for a few minutes. He said, the Holy Spirit began convicting my heart. And he said, I bowed my head and said, oh, God, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. He said, I got that off the screen. And said, Lord, I don't want to ever do that again. Please help me. I don't want to do it again. And he said, I did good for three days. He said, everybody's gone again. He said, this time on purpose, I typed it in. Viewed the stuff, got under conviction, confessed it, asked the Lord, forgive me. He said, preacher, to make a long story short, first time an accident, but over the next 30 days, he said, I looked at that stuff at least, at least, at least 10 times deliberately. Total of 11 times. He said, you know what I thought? Nobody will ever know. And then he said this. He said, do you know, preacher, there's a record kept? I said, yes, there is by the God of heaven. And my friend said, not just him. Not just him. He said, you know how I know that? I said, how'd you know? He said, uh, 36 days or so after the first accidental viewing of pornography, 35 days or 34 days after the deliberate viewing of it, he said, I was called into the boardroom. He said, there were 10 other guys with me. 
He said there were 11 packs of paper around that boardroom table up here where the CEO is ultimately going to sit. There was no pack of paper. He said all of us coming in, kind of looking at each other, and he said the packs of paper were turned upside down. We all sat down. CEO comes in and says, gentlemen, sit down. And as soon as everybody sat down, he said, you can turn over the packet of paper. He said, guys, I'm just going to cut to the chase. He said, every one of you in this room, at least, at least, at least three times, most of you more times than that by far, have viewed pornographic imagery while here at work. He said, if you look at that packet of paper, when we hired you, we stated to you we have a zero tolerance policy for pornography at work. And you signed a statement stating you understood that. My friend said, yes, I did sign a statement exactly stating I understood that. The guy said, you've all violated the policy at least three times, most of you, way more than that. He said, this meeting is going to be short, and I'm not trying to be unkind, fellas, but every one of you are being terminated right now. My friend looks at me, and he said, Dave, do you know how tough it was to leave that room and walk out into the rest of the building and everybody see me going home and wonder why? I will give him this. This is character. He said, I didn't want any rumors. I didn't want anything that was inaccurate. So he said, I felt compelled to tell him. And so he said, I straightened my spine. He put on my big boy britches. And I told him, I violated the no pornography policy. And that's why I'm being dismissed. Thank God for his honesty. He said, preacher, that was tough. But he said, I'm here to tell you something. It wasn't near as tough as going home in the middle of the day and walking into the house and my bride looking at me of 25 years and saying, how come you're home in the middle of the day? And he said, I had to tell her what I'd done. He said, that's real tough. And then, Brother Mark, where are you? No, no, I'm not. I'm just going to tell you what my friend said, okay? And by the way, you're on radio. This is why I'm telling you so you can share it. My friend looked me in the eye and he said this. He said, Dave, you tell America's men four words from me. I said, what are they? I want you to share it on your radio program if you can. He said, the four words are these. Tell America's men, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And it's not. How long has it been? Since we were known in the halls of learning for our intellect, how long has it been, number two, since we've been known here in the house of pleasure? You say, preacher, what does that mean? Pastor, again, there's something I haven't shared yet about the 425 foot long, 225 foot wide building, the Temple of Diana. Do you know that building was known in the ancient world for having 1,000 temple priestesses meandering through the 425 by 225 foot structure. Temple priestesses, folks, I'm not trying to be graphic, I'm not trying to be gross, but I am gonna be honest. Those temple priestesses were nothing less than temple prostitutes who would pander to the lusts of men from all over the ancient world who would come there and pastor whatever they could afford, they would purchase, and the Temple of Diana was nothing but an ancient house of prostitution. Paul shows up, rents a lecture hall for Two years. Preaches the word of the living God. Becomes known in the halls of learning for his intellect. But he also becomes known in the house of pleasure. For what, Brother Dave? In the house of pleasure. For his interference. Paul was a threat to the kingdom of darkness. Are you with me? How many of you know who Dr. Tony Evans is? Oak Cliff Bible Fellow. Don't you love Dr. Evans? I love that. Have you noticed this, Brother Mark? Have you noticed this? Pat? Tony, black preachers in general can get by saying stuff we white preachers can never get by with saying. If I tried some of the stuff Dr. Evans says, I'd be run out of town on a rail. Any of you read Dr. Evans' book, Kingdom Man? Anybody read that? Isn't it awesome? He's got a book, Kingdom Woman, Kingdom Kids, or Kingdom Young. Anyway, I read that First chapter of Kingdom Man. I'm, don't get mad at me. Don't throw him book at me. I'm quoting Dr. Evans. In the first chapter, first paragraph, here's what he says. A kingdom man is the kind of guy that when he gets up in the morning, puts his feet on the floor, the devil says, oh, crap, he's up. <laughs> I'm going to have trouble today. Steve Swan's up and moving. I can't believe you said that word. 
I'm quoting Dr. Evans, okay? I'm quoting Dr. Evans. Listen, preacher, I don't know about you. I want to be a kingdom man that when I put my feet on the floor in the morning, the devil says, oh, no, trouble's coming. Trouble, I'm going to have a tough day. Listen, that was Paul known in the house of pleasure for his interference. Known in the halls of learning for his intellect. Known in the house of pleasure for his interference. I want you to look at Acts 19, one final place, and we're done. Now, I've said everything I've said to get to right here. Please don't let that scare you. I just want to show you this, and we're done. Look at Acts 19, verse 11. Now, this is mentioned second in the chapter, but I've saved it till last because it's by far and away the most interesting. Look at Acts 19, verse 11. Same city, Ephesus, same time period, the two years that Paul's leasing that lecture hall. Look at verse 11. The Bible says, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Now, look up at me for just a moment. God wrought, qualifying word, special miracles. A guy told me one time, he said, Preacher, I thought if it classified as a miracle, it was automatically special. I said, I agree. But I want you to notice, the Holy Spirit's doing something here. The word special here in Acts 19 and 11 is the word in the Greek language that means unique. Unique. Pastor, God is working some unique miracles by the hands of Paul. Not duplicated everywhere. What was the nature of these unique miracles? Look, if you would, please, at verse number 12. Here is the unique nature of the miracles. Look at verse 12. So that from his body, from Paul's body, were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs. Would you look up at me for a minute? Handkerchiefs. Handkerchiefs. Pieces of fabric or aprons. Pieces of fabric. Watch this. And the diseases departed from them and evil spirits went out of them. You say, preacher, what does that mean? It means Ephesus is a thriving city. It's a major metropolitan city. Brother Jacques, Paul can't be everywhere. So God's working some unique miracles. They're taking pieces of fabric, handkerchief, apron. They're laying it on Paul's body. They're removing it from Paul's body. They're carrying it to afflicted persons. And by the way, I'm not insinuating anything. But I'm going to use you, my dear brother, as the illustration. Okay, I'm not insinuating you're diseased or demon-possessed. Okay, so be my friend after this, okay? You're just close and got a smile on your face, and I love that, okay? Fabric is being taken off of Paul's body, carried to persons that have a disease or a demon-possessed. They're laying the fabric on the individuals that has prior been on Paul. When they do that, the Bible says if they're diseased, they're healed. If they're demon-possessed, the demons leave. Can I hear an Amen. The Bible says that is a special, unique miracle. You say, Brother Dave, that's not unique. I had a guy tell me that. He said, that's not unique. I said, why would you say it's not unique when the Bible says it is unique? He, forgive me, I don't want to make any enemies, but I want you to hear me. He said, it's not unique because I watch that kind of stuff all the time on Christian television. Hmm. I said, let's be known in the halls of learning for our intellect for a second, shall we? I said, can I ask you a couple of questions? Those people on Christian TV, if they can do what they claim to do, if they can wave their hand and everybody falls over, if they can blow on people and they fall out and it's not their bad breath creating that response, if they can rub portions of people's bodies and extract invisible tumors from their body, if they can do all this stuff, I said, I've always asked myself this question. I've never found an answer yet. Maybe you can help me. If they can do all this stuff, why do they rent an arena to do it? He said, what do you mean, preacher? I said, if they can heal people, if they can extract tumors and, and heal, why don't they go to the cancer ward? In the local hospital. That's ground zero for healing. Can I hear an amen? Why don't they go there? You know what my friend did? He looked at me and said, well, Dave, they're not going to go there. I said, why not? He said, because there, and I need to tell you this, my friend had been involved in a lot of this stuff and had seen the good, bad, and ugly. He said, Dave, they don't go to the hospital because in the hospital, they don't have their specially designed platform." with their electric shock device in the bottom up. I said, you mean they do that? He said, they do. I said, what, what, what does the electric shock do? When the guy waves his hand, they get a shock and they say, oh, that was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he said, at the hospital, they don't have that stuff. He said, I traveled in this as a lost man for years. Wow. Now I want you to watch. 
It is not new. The traveling medicine shows are not new. Preacher, they're as old as the book of Acts. You say, how do you know that? Now, folks, I want, you, I want you to watch something. I want you to see this. This is amazing. Look at your Bible, and my Bible's down here. I want you to see what it says. Look at Acts 19. Let your eyes rest on verse number 13. God is using Paul. From his body is being carried fabric, laid on people that are diseased or demon-possessed. If they're sick, they're healed. If they're demon-possessed, the demons leave. Now, watch verse 13. God is using Paul. Some counterfeits show up. Then certain, verse 13 of Acts 19 says, of the vagabond Jews. The word vagabond means itinerant, traveling. Certain of the traveling Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you by Jesus. The word adjure means command. We command you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. You say, Brother Dave, what in the world does that mean? Now, I want to illustrate something for you tonight. Pastor, would you mind helping me? Would you mind helping me? I want you just to come and, and stand right there and face me. Just stand right there and face me. Okay, no, I'm not going to shock you. <laughs> but I do want you to be my friend after this. Okay, please be my friend. I want you to be a demon-possessed guy. Can you do that? Okay. Quite, did I get the right guy? No, 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 I'm just, I'm just, I'm just joking. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Okay, okay, he said, Brother Dave, help me know how to do that. Okay, all right. Okay. <laughs> Man, tough to get anything on him. Anyway, you don't have to contort or anything. I just want you to stand there. I, I know the story. You do know the story. Do I have to rip your clothes? No, you do not do that. I'm just asking. I need to get somebody that doesn't know the story. No, no. Oh, I love you, preacher. He's awesome. Man, we have hit it off. I love him. I love him. Anyway, I just want you to stand there and pretend you're demon possessed. You don't have to contort or anything like that. Now, I want you to watch the Bible. I'm going to struggle to get through this. Now, anyway. Um, the Bible says certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, I'm going to be one of those, took upon them to call over them that were possessed with evil spirits. That's going to be your preacher playing that part. We take upon ourselves to call over them that are possessed with evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, we're calling the Lord's name over you. And the Bible records the formula, the magic formula that we use. The formula is this, I adjure, which means command, and we're not talking so much to you, we're talking you know, to the demon inside of you. I command you in the name of Jesus, come out, come out, come out in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. Now, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do it. I want you to watch this, and I want you to tell me what is wrong with it. It should be glaringly obvious. You're demon-possessed. I'm one of these vagabond Jews. I come up to you, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to the demon inside you, and I say to the demon, I command you, come out, come out, come out, come out, demon, in the name of Jesus. The Jesus that that dude Paul is preaching about. Come out, demon, in the name of Jesus. The Jesus that that guy Paul is preaching about. Now talk to me, what's wrong with that? Say it again. They couldn't do it. You don't believe? Yes. They don't say come out in the name of Jesus that we're preaching because they don't know the Jesus that Paul's preaching. So for authority, to have any authority, they have to appeal to the Jesus, come out in the name of Jesus that Paul is preaching. Now can I say this? You're dabbling with the dangerous anytime you don't know Jesus. But you're doubly dabbling with danger if you're playing around with demons and you don't know Jesus. Now, Pastor, you can be seated right here on the front row. Now, don't, don't go back here, because you're going to graduate here in just a second, okay? You're going you're gonna to graduate. <laughs> now, I want you to watch your Bible. Watch, I'm in trouble on the golf course tomorrow. I can see you coming. I want you, watch your Bible. Look at verse number 14. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and chief of the priests which did so. In other words, in the city of Ephesus, there's a guy named Sceva. He's chief priest. He's got seven sons. He has seven sons. Try this little incantation that Pastor and I have just illustrated. When they try it, come out in the name of Jesus that Paul's preaching, they get something they didn't bargain for. <laughs> Look at verse 14 again. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and chief of the priests which did so. Watch verse 15. When they tried that, verse 15 says, and the evil spirit, would you say the next word out loud? Answered. It means the evil spirit talked back to them. And said, watch what the demon said. Jesus, 
You said come out in the name of Jesus? Jesus, I know. You said come out in the name of Jesus that Paul is preaching. Look at the rest of it. And Paul, I know. Look at the end of the verse, though. I don't think I ever heard of you guys. <laughs> but who in the world are you? And by the way, if you read the rest of the chapter, the man possessed by those demons jumps on them and they went <laughs> fleeing out of the house, naked and wounded. That's why there is no removing of the clothes here in the, in the illustration, okay? Now watch. Not trying to impress you, but I want you to learn something. The, the New Testament was inspired by God primarily in the Greek language, okay? We're reading the English translation from the Greek. Everybody with me? Do you know the Greeks had three words for knowledge, three words for knowing? We have one in English for knowing. It's spelled K-N-O-W. The Greek language was a very exact language. They had three words for knowledge. Two of those three are used in verse 15. One of them, one of the Greek words is used when the demon says, Jesus, I know. That's one Greek word. The next statement, and Paul, I know. Same English word, but it's a different Greek word. Why, Brother Dave, is the demon using two different words for knowing? Because he's trying to say two different things. Now, Pastor, I want you to come up here. You're no longer demon-possessed. Can we give him a round of applause? Never was demon-possessed. But anyway, in the story, you know, I want you to stand right here if you would and face, face the back if you would. All right, now, you're no longer, yeah, just face that way. You're no longer demon-possessed. Now you're Paul. You're the Apostle Paul. That's a big graduation. Would you agree? All right. All right. Now, now I want to illustrate something, folks, and I'm as serious as I can be about this. Paul, when I tell you, in just a minute, when I tell you I want you to do something, I want you to walk right back there where that brother on the right here, right in front of the sound booth is with the, uh, kind of the stripes. I want you to walk to where he is, just at a casual clip, turn around, come back here, turn and stand just like you are right now when I tell you to do it. Just walk back there, turn, come back up here, stand just like you are right now. All right, when I tell you. This is Paul. I'm going to now be the demon. The demon said, Jesus, I know. That is the Greek word for a knowledge gained by experience. I know Jesus by experience. You say, preacher, what does that mean? There are some Bible scholars that say this, and I understand where they get, why they come to that. I agree with them. They say the demon is saying, I know who Jesus is by experience. I've had a run-in with him before. I know his power. Some Bible scholars go so far as to say this demon that's in this guy may have been cast out of somebody else by Jesus at a prior time. I know who Jesus is by experience. I had a run-in with him. And Paul, I know. Totally different Greek word. This is a knowledge gained from proximity. You say, what does that mean? It means from being close to. I know who Jesus is because I had a run-in with him, but I know who Paul is because I've been close to him. Let me illustrate that. Paul, start walking. I know who Jesus is because I had a run-in with him, but I know who Paul is because I've followed him. I've been close to him. I've watched him up close and in person. I've seen him, you know, when he lost his temper. I've seen him when he, uh, you know, was talking to people. Or, and I've watched him when he was watching TV. I mean, I, I, I've followed Paul up close and in person. And the conclusion I've come to from knowing Jesus is that Jesus is the real deal. But from following Paul, the conclusion I've come to about that is he's the real deal too. But you dudes, never heard of you seven boys. Ah, they take off running. Wow. Thank you, preacher, so much. Can we give him a round of applause? Awesome. 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 Known in the halls of learning for his intellect. Known in the house of pleasure for his interference. Folks, think about this. Known in hell. Preacher, when the demon imps of hell speak and say, I know who Paul is, what a testimony. What a testimony. Known in, what's Paul known in hell for? 
known in the halls of learning for his intellect, known in the house of pleasure for his interference, but he's known in hell for his integrity. Jesus is the real deal. Paul is the real deal. But you seven birds never heard of you. You're not real and you don't scare me in the least. Ah. Wow. I want to ask you something. Are we known in hell for our integrity? You say, preacher, that's just Paul. Mm -mm. Pastor, this thing of devil, demons following people, knowing what they do, is as old as the oldest book in the Bible. It's as old as the book of Job. By the way, Job is not the first book in the order of books, but it is the oldest book. Do you remember in Job chapter number 2? The Bible says there came a time when the sons of men presented themselves to the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord looks down and says to the devil, Have you ever considered, ever noticed my servant Job that there's none like him? He loves me and hates evil. You know what the devil does? He looks up at the Lord and he says, yes, I have noticed Job. And what I've noticed about him, Lord, is this. It's like you've blessed him on every side. I mean, you've hedged him in with blessings. But my assessment of your friend Job, Lord, would be this. If you let me take everything away from him, he will curse you to your face. How many of you remember this? You know what the Lord says? Take everything you want. Just don't touch him. Preacher, isn't it amazing when the devil is given permission to take everything from Job? He takes his cattle and his sheep and he takes all of his bank account away for lack of a better way to describe it. Goes after his kids. Which means he knew, the devil knew where Job kept his camels and his sheep. He knew where Job's children lived. How did the devil know that? He's not omnipresent. He had been following old Job. And he went and took all that stuff away. And you know what? Thank God. Job said, naked came I, out, came I out of my mother's womb. I had nothing when I got here. Naked shall I return. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Wow. Wow. Preacher, the devil had been watching old Job, hadn't he? Have you ever noticed him? Sure have. Now, the devil's assessment of Job was dead wrong, but he had been watching him. Actually, the devil was trying to move the Lord to... Do something to Job. But you know what? God loves his children, doesn't he? Now, he'll let us go through tests and trials, but he'll do us good and not evil all the days of our life. Yeah. Preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying this. Demons watch us. Demons watch us. Pastor, I think about this regularly. The demon hordes of hell... Not all of them, but maybe a couple, one. They watch Dave Kistler in my private world. I read a great book years ago by Gordon MacDonald. It's called Ordering Your Private World. Because see, all you folks can see of Dave Kistler for the most part is my public life. I know what Dave looks like and I know how he appears to operate in public behind the pulpit, when we take him out for dinner. You can find out a good bit about people over dinner. But all you see really is my, my public life. But what am I in my private world? That's where the demon imps of hell know me for real. And folks, I want you to think about this. What if tonight, like they spoke to the seven sons of Sceva, what if demons just started talking out loud? See, the demon world, the demonic world, the spirit world is pretty much unseen most of the time. But what if they started manifesting and talking and communicating what they know about me or you or you or you? What would they say? Would they say, I know Dave Kistler and he's real. What he appears to be on the outside is exactly what he is in his private world. Or would they say this, no, I know what he appears to be in public. But see, his private life's a little different. 
what would they say? About you. You say, preacher, that scares me. Probably should. And by the way, if that makes us uncomfortable, you know what ought to really make us uncomfortable? Preacher, it's that verse in Genesis where Hagar is out in the desert and she's hiding under a shrub bush to get out of the sun and she utters this amazing statement and she says, Thou God seest me. See, all the devil and the demon hordes of hell can see is my actions, my lifestyle choices. But see, God sees why I live the life I live and the motive behind my lifestyle choices. Is everybody with me? Not just what I do. God sees why I do what I do and why you do what you do. What I'm wondering is, are we known in hell for our integrity? Now, with this, I'm done. Pastor, in 1992, I was a much younger man, and I was over in Tennessee, a little community called Obion, O-B-I-O-N, Obion, Tennessee, Minick Bible Church. I don't even know if the church is still in existence. It probably is, but it's a beautiful section of Tennessee. There's a little bluff there that runs through Tennessee that has every animal that Texas has. Rattlesnakes, coyotes, I mean, everything. It's, just, it's a beautiful place. Rugged man's world. I love it. It was a Sunday morning. My friend, college friend, Steve was the pastor of that church. And I got up, Pastor, I'll never forget it. We'd prayed, we'd planned preached my heart out, gave the invitation, nothing. In fact, it was weird. It was like trying to punch your way through a brick wall. It was one of the hardest times I've ever had to preach. I mean, it's like, it was just your words going out and dropping. I asked my wife later, I said, honey, could you sense what I was? She said, sense it, you could cut it with a knife. It was thick in there. Weird. Well, I turned it over to the pastor, just like I do to your wonderful pastor every night. And the pastor there in that church, Steve Townsend, got up and he looked at his new congregation. He hadn't been there long. And he said, folks, I know God's speaking. He said, I know he is. And he said, I know. And he got a little teared up. I know there's business that we need to do with God. So he said, I'm just wondering if there's anybody in here. The invitation's been given, but I'm wondering if there's anybody in here who God's speaking to you and you need to say something. Pastors, I'm standing here, right back here where my brother Dave is sitting. A man by the name of Barton Stover raised his hand. I'll never forget it. You're going to meet Barton one day. He raised his hand. Pastor Steve said, yes, Barton, what would you like to say? Barton stepped out of the row and out into the aisle. And folks, he began to do something I've never heard before nor since. I don't mean he began to weep. I mean he began to wail. Kind of like this. Oh... Oh, it's like he was in agony of soul. And preacher, amidst the wailing, he tried to talk and you could make out some of what he was saying. And what he was saying was this, we got problems. And everybody in the community knows we got problems. And he said, I'm tired, I'm tired of playing a game. And then preacher with as much energy as he could muster, he made this gesture as he said this. He said, this morning, I'm taking my mask off. And he sat down. If that's my wife, tell her I'll call her in just a second. I really will, okay? Don't feel bad. Please don't feel bad. My phone goes off and I'm the preacher. Okay, please don't feel bad. That is all right. I'm taking my mask off. Brother Dave, what was going on, I found out after the service. Barton had two kids, a son and daughter-in-law or a daughter and son-in-law. I don't remember which it was. But they were married, but they had been separated for months, three months to be exact. They were coming to church and sitting in the pew like they were married and living together in a happy relationship, but they weren't. They had separated. They literally would meet 
at a service station a ways away from the church, get in one car, come to church, go home after church, get in their different cars and go the different directions and live different lives. And it was driving Barton crazy. And he said, we got problems. And everybody knows we got And I'm tired of playing a game. Tired of pretending. And this morning I'm taking my mask off. And he sat down. Pastor Steve said, thank you, Barton, for your honesty and transparency. Anybody else? Ma'am, right where you are was a lady who was a first-time visitor. I found out later they'd been inviting her for three years. She chose this Sunday to come. She raised her hand and Pastor Steve said, yes, ma'am. She stood up and pastors, I'm standing here. I'll never forget it as long as I live. She said, I'm not sure if this is the right time or not, but I'd like to get saved. <laughs> Pastor Steve said, it's, it's exactly the right time. <laughs> he said to his wife, Kay, would you, would you go take this precious lady and open a Bible and show her how to get saved? She got born again. Can I hear an amen? amen. She was the first of 20-some people that got saved that week. Wow. Do you know what she told the pastor's wife? I'd already heard the sermon. And she had. She didn't come forward in the invitation. But she said, when that guy back there took his mask off and came clean and got honest, she said, I figured if he could do it, so could I. So I'm not sure if it's the right time or not, but I'd like to get saved. Preacher, it was on from there. It was on from there. That building filled up all week long. And God did a work in that community. I want to ask you something. You need to take a mask off, get real and right with God. The demon imps of hell know. They know where we stand because they've watched us. More importantly, the God of heaven really knows where we stand because he can see down into the motives of our heart. Folks, I don't know about you. There's going to be a test again for this. But I want to be so real and so right with God. I want to be so transparent that there's nothing the devil can say, but that boy is real. And to coin a phrase from Tony Evans, oh crap, he's up. And he's on the move. Amen. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? Father, would you speak to us? Father, I love you. Not like I want to, but I do love you. And Lord, I thank you for who you are and how great you've been to me. You saved my soul as a young man. And Lord, I strayed from you. Tried to do life my way and wanted it the way I wanted it run. And Lord, you took me down in love and grace and mercy. You allowed things to happen to me. Athletic injuries and a host of other things to arrest my attention as a high school student. And I thank you for every bit of it. And Lord, I thank you that you called me to preach. And that Lord, I've had this opportunity now for 39 years to travel all over the world preaching the gospel of Jesus, telling people what you can do for them because, Lord, I've seen you do it for me. You changed my life. And for that, I thank you. I'm eternally indebted to you. So, Lord, I pray for myself first tonight that I might be every day, every moment of every day, real and right with you. So that, Lord, I can be a conduit, a channel through whom you can work to impact the lives of others. And yes, Lord, even impact my nation. Father, I pray if there are folks in this room that have never met you as Savior, help them to understand the demon imps of hell know that. They know. And Father, I pray rather than trying to pretend to be something they're not, I pray they'd come to you tonight, those that don't know you as Savior really, and be born again before it's eternally too late. And then, Lord, I pray for others of us that are saved, but, Lord, maybe we've allowed an attitude to creep into our life, a habit. And if the demon imps of hell were to speak and tell what they know, they would say, I know what you are in public, but you've got this habit in your private world. You've got this attitude you're harboring. You're holding bitterness or anger or resentment. You've got this, 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 or this going on in your life, in your private world. Lord, if there's anything like that going on in our private lives, Father, I pray tonight would be the night when we would confess those to you and just get real 
and right with you and walk out of here tonight light as a feather, an instrument you can use powerfully for your honor and glory. And the Lord will give you glory, praise, thanksgiving for all you do tonight. Now, folks, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I want to ask you just a couple of questions. Wow, you guys are my, almost my very, in fact, you may be my favorite people to preach to. I love you so much. I do. I love you enough to ask you this question. How many of you in the room can say with absolute certainty, Brother Dave, I know it. God knows it. The demon hordes of hell know it. I'm saved. My sin's forgiven. I know I'm going to heaven when I leave this life. If you know that's true, you're born again, saved. Those are all synonymous terms. Forgiven. I know I'm going to heaven when life ends for me down here. If you know that's true, would you lift your hand, hold it as high as you can possibly hold it. Dave, I know. God knows. The demon hordes of hell know that I'm forgiven. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Awesome. Beautiful sight. Second question, is there anyone in the room, anyone at all, you do not know? And the thought that the demon hordes of hell know you're not saved and are trying to keep you from coming to Jesus, which they are, even at this very moment, it amazes me what happens during invitations to distract people. I was preaching in a camp and preacher right at the most critical part of the service a fighter jet flew over treetop level, deafened everything for 30 seconds as it came, as it went. Preacher, that's a coincidence. Don't think so. Devil will do anything to keep you from coming to Jesus. So I'm wondering tonight, are there some folks in the room, anybody, that would be honest enough, transparent enough to say, you know what, Dave, I couldn't raise my hand to the first question. No, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. But I am sure about this, preacher, I don't want to go to hell. Man, I know I don't want to go to hell. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven, but I know I don't want to go to hell. Preacher, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about my eternal future. Would you pray for me? I'd love to. Now, no one's looking but me. If you're not sure you're going to heaven, but you'd let me pray for you, I wonder if right now you'd lift your hand long enough for me to see it anywhere in the room, anywhere in the room. Preacher, I'm not sure. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Others, preacher, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven, but I know this, I don't want to go to hell. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven, but I know this, I don't want to go to hell. Please pray for me. I'd love to have that. Thank you. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your concern. Bless your heart. You may put it down. Thank you. Are there any others? So glad I waited. Anybody else besides these incredibly courageous people. Father, I pray tonight. There are several that lifted their hand very clearly, very obviously, very definitively. They wanted me to see their uplifted hand and waited until I saw it, and I thank you for their courage. Thank you for their concern for their own eternal future. And Lord, I pray tonight would be the night when before it's eternally too late, they'll come to you and get their eternal salvation settled and leave tonight, drive off this property tonight, knowing, not hoping, not wondering, but knowing they're going to heaven. And Father, for what you do, I'm going to thank you. Now folks, with your heads still bowed, your eyes still closed, Pastor, I want to ask you to do this. If you'd be so kind, you've done it several nights already. One final time, would you be willing just to step right over here to my right at the very back of the auditorium? Thank you so very, very much. Folks, a number of things have happened today that are factoring into what I'm about to do. I'm not trying to coerce anybody to do anything. I can't do that. Don't want to do that. But I want to go a little further than I've gone any night this week. Now, no one's looking but just me, and I appreciate the cooperation. If you lifted your hand just a couple of seconds ago and said, Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. I want to thank you for doing that. I respect you highly for your concern. I want you to know I love you. I love you enough to do what I'm about to do. Now, no one's looking but me. 
If you lifted your hand and let me pray for you, you know who you are. You know where you're seated in the auditorium, as do I. I want to ask you if you'd just be willing to do this. If you lifted your hand and let me pray for you, would you just lift your head, open your eyes, and look at me so that I can see your eyes? Thank you and thank you. Were you serious about that when you lifted your hand? Were you really serious? All right, could I ask you this if you were? Pastor standing right back there, would you be willing just to get up and go meet him? Let him put someone with you that'll take a Bible, show you how you can know Jesus. Would you be willing to do that tonight? If you would, I want to encourage you just to go back to the back. Would you be willing to do it? Not trying to twist your arm. I just want to give you an opportunity to do that. I encourage you to. While you're thinking about that, I want to ask one final question. Christian friends, I want to address this to us. Known in the halls of learning for your intellect. Known in the house of pleasure for your interference. Most importantly, known in hell for your integrity. I don't know about you, I want to be known all three places for all three things. Tonight I want to ask this question. If God has spoken to you as a Christian and you'd be willing to say, I want to be a kingdom man, a kingdom woman. I want to be a kingdom young person. I want to be so known in the halls of learning and in the house of pleasure and in hell itself for my intellect and my interference and my integrity. I want to be a kingdom man, a kingdom woman. I want the devil to get upset and nervous when I get up in the morning because I'm a threat to him. That's what kingdom people are. That's what Paul was. Lord, that's what I want to be. If that's you as a Christian, then I want to invite you to do something, friends, and I'm as serious as I can be. I'm not taking this lightly. I don't think you are either. This is vitally important. If that's the desire of your heart as a Christian, I wonder if you'd be willing to just rise from where you're currently seated and do what folks have done every service. And that is make your way down around this altar. I'm already here because I want to be a kingdom man like never before. I wonder if you'd be willing to come here as a Christian and just say, Lord, I want to be a kingdom man, a kingdom woman. I want to be known in the halls of learning for my intellect. I want to be known in the house of pleasure for my interference. I want to be known in hell for my integrity. Help me be a kingdom man, kingdom woman, kingdom young person. If that's you, could I invite you? Would you be willing to come here, join me in the altar and tell God that and mean it? If you would, I invite you to come right now. God bless you, fellas and ladies. God bless you, men. God bless you, ladies. I want to be a kingdom man, Lord. God bless you, young people. I want to be a kingdom man. I want to be a kingdom woman. I want to have an impact for the glory of God. I want to be a threat to the kingdom of darkness. I want to be a kingdom man, kingdom woman, kingdom young person. Just If you want to kneel, you can. If you want to stand, that's fine. Lord, I want to be a kingdom man or a kingdom woman. Help me to be that. Friends, it's why we're here. It's why we're here. It's why we're here. God, make me a kingdom man, a kingdom woman, a kingdom young person. If you don't know Jesus, Especially if you lifted your hand, Pastor, still standing at the back. You've loved nothing more than to put someone with you that will introduce you to Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for putting into the pages of sacred scripture this phenomenal chapter called Acts 19. Lord, you've put Paul in the influence of his life in capsule form in that chapter. Father, I pray you would never forget it. I pray, Lord, after tonight as we drive home, tomorrow, throughout the day, the day after, next week, Father, remind us of this man called Paul, formerly Saul of Tarsus, who got saved and he became a kingdom warrior. And he had an impact for your glory on his culture and even on hell itself. 
to be known in hell is a profound and powerful thing. Father, forgive us for not being known much here and certainly not being known much in hell. Change that tonight. Change it tonight. And Lord, make us people that are kingdom people, that have an influence in both worlds for your glory and for your honor. Now bless, Lord, as pastor comes to close this service. Guide him by your spirit. And Lord, bring us back tomorrow night for a message, Lord, that you've laid on my heart specifically for tomorrow evening. And Father, I pray we would leave tomorrow night, leave the end of this week so on fire that nothing could extinguish the flame. And Father, for how you work, again, we're going to thank you and praise you. In Jesus' precious name, I do pray. And all God's people who prayed with me said, Amen. Amen. Pastor, you can.